I'm Matt Robertson from the Mayo Clinic in Florida. I'm one of the two GYN oncologists that we have on staff here. I'm very fortunate this afternoon to have a dear friend and colleague, Dr. Sanjay Bagaria, one of our surgical oncologists uh, here. He also has a partner, uh, Dr. Gabriel, and we'll talk about the roles in which we play. Uh, Dr. Bagaria and I have been asked to talk today about the utilization of HIPEC, uh, heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy, in the treatment of ovarian cancer. This is something that obviously I'm extremely passionate about. Uh, as most of you know, unfortunately, about three quarters of women, uh, when they're diagnosed with ovarian cancer, it's usually either stage three or four, the disease is already spread into the upper abdomen or potentially into the lungs by that stage as well. So in any modalities, any treatment options that we have that can hopefully improve survival, uh, is something that we're going to look at and pursue very aggressively. So what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about the rationale, if you will, uh, why we've started incorporating HIPEC into our management for ovarian cancer. And then I'll ask Dr. Bagaria to talk about the nuts and bolts as to how it's actually performed and then we'll probably talk a little bit about some of the potential complications uh, that could occur with this and how it affects the post-operative management for our patients. Um, I'm going to start, Sanjay, at any time, jump in here if I say something I shouldn't, uh, if you will. So why did we start uh, using HIPEC uh, for ovarian cancer? Um, probably the best um, support that we have in the literature comes from a study that was published in the New England Journal 2018. This was a European study performed in the Netherlands. And basically what they looked at was that they took uh, 245 patients who had been given neoadjuvant chemotherapy. When we say that term, we mean giving chemotherapy before surgery. So these are patients that had advanced ovarian cancer, and then they received three cycles of paclitaxel and carboplatin chemotherapy. After those three cycles, these patients were taken to surgery for surgical debulking, removal of as much tumor as possible. At the time of that surgery, they then stratified them based upon the amount of disease that they thought was going to be left into half of those patients received HIPEC, heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy at the end of the surgical debulking, while the other half didn't. All of these patients, after they recovered, went on to receive three additional cycles of intravenous paclitaxel and carboplatin, which is once again, the standard of care. So once again, the only different is, difference uh, was, if you will, half the patients at the time of surgery got high pack and the other half didn't. And the important thing for us is that, what did the study show? Um, Relapse-free survival was uh, increased in those patients who received the HIPEC for uh, about three and a half months, and overall survival was actually improved just shy of 12 months. So clearly, this showed that the application or the inclusion of HIPEC at the time of that surgery improved the survival of these patients. Now, Anytime we're doing something and um, we're looking for a beneficial outcome, you have to always balance that with the potential complications. And the important thing with the study was besides being positive with a beneficial improvement in survival, it also showed that the side effects were no different in these two arms. And so that was really key for us. So that is the rationale as to why we have started incorporating uh, HIPEC as an option for appropriately selected patients here at Mayo Clinic Florida. Um, our surgical oncology colleagues have had far more experience with HIPEC since this treatment really started 
with uh, colorectal cancers, colon cancers, and therefore they've been doing it a lot longer. So we actually made the decision once we started looking into this that we would want to have one of our surgical oncologists uh, with us uh, and us being my partner, Tree Den and I, the other G1 oncologist, when we did this procedure, we felt that it would uh, provide the safest way uh, to do it with the greatest possible outcome for our patients. So I'm now gonna ask Dr. Bagaria to sort of talk about the nuts and bolts as to how we go about administering the HIPEC and what it actually is. Uh, thank you, Matt. So as Dr. Robertson mentioned, it's a team approach. So uh, we work together with GYN Oncology to treat these advanced ovarian, advanced ovarian cancer patients with HIPEC. And what exactly is HIPEC? So it stands for hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy or heated chemotherapy. And the idea is that after surgery, after we've cut out all the cancer, even though we've removed everything that we visibly can see that is cancerous, we know that there is likely microscopic disease left behind, disease that's still there that we can't see, so therefore we can't cut it out. And what are we gonna do about that? And so the way HIPEC works is that this heated chemotherapy, we put it into the abdomen, and the goal of this heated chemotherapy is to eradicate this leftover microscopic disease. The hope is that it will kill it. And the reason why we do it with heat is that we think that the hot or the hot chemotherapy or the heated chemotherapy works better in heat, has a better way of penetrating the tissue and killing leftover cancer cells. And the heat itself actually can even kill cancer. And the chemotherapy that we use for ovarian cancer patients is a sister of the carboplatin drug. It's called cisplatin. That's the drug that was used in the randomized trial uh, that Dr. Robertson mentioned earlier. Uh, we do this heated chemotherapy for about 90 minutes. So during those 90 minutes, we put these catheters into the abdomen that bring the chemo in and take the chemo out and it circulates for about 90 minutes at a very high temperature, somewhere between 105 to 110 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. After 90 minutes, uh, we take out all the chemotherapy, we make sure everything looks good, and then we close our patients up and send them off to the uh, floor to get recovery. And one of the things that we get asked a lot, uh, Matt, I would say is like, what are the side effects of, of the surgery? And, you know, I'm curious to hear what you have to say, but what have you seen? And I can also tell you what I've seen as well with these types of operations. I think the, um, the complication, and it's really difficult, if you will, uh, the side effect, if you will, because if we are doing the big laparotomy incision, which a lot of times we're forced to do with ovarian cancer, um, we can have an ileus where the small intestines in layman's terms sort of go to sleep. Our, our, our intestines don't like to be handled. So we're manipulating them at the time of surgery. We're packing them out of the way. So we have exposure. So, you know, 40% of our patients historically may have an ileus after the surgery, but we do tend to see it after, um, the HIPEC administration as well. Um, you know, one of the major concerns as well as the platinum-based chemotherapy is some form of kidney damage. Uh, there's a medication that we give uh, prior to the initiation or the starting of the HIPEC to make certain that the kidneys are being protected. You know, occasionally we will see, and, and Sanjay, once again, this you've got far more experience, but, you know, we'll see the creatinine rise uh, after uh, surgery, but, you know, fortunately we haven't seen um, a, a renal failures, uh, or if it has, it's been exceptionally rare and, 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 and fortunately reversible. I mean, I we always like worry that it like, couldn't you know, be. Yeah, most of the complications that we see are really related to the scope of the operation. So, you know, our patients will have fatigue. They'll take, they may have nausea. They may have a while for their intestines to wake up, but all in all, you know, most patients do well. Um, if you can get through all that, you, 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 most patients do well. And I'll say that relates to the point of the chemotherapy. Um, it's, it's not going into your veins. It's going into your abdomen. And so because it's not going into your veins, it's not going to the rest of your body, it's just 
hanging out where the cancer is located. So the hope is that this high dose of chemotherapy for 90 minutes will kill cancer, but not enough to get absorbed into your body to go everywhere else. And that's really the idea behind HIPAC. Right. And I think, you know, we're, we're talking about that just the way the cancer spreads. Uh, a lot of times we are forced because we need the exposure. We are forced to make that uh, rather large, generous vertical abdominal incision. Some of these patients after neoadjuvant chemotherapy have almost complete uh, resolution of their tumor bar burden. So there are cases as well that we can do this laparoscopically, robotically. And, uh, you know, after Dr. Den and I uh, performed the surgical removal, uh, Dr. Bagaria and Gabriel were able to come in and do that through our small incisions as well, but it, it depends upon the unique uh, individual. Um, but sort of going back. Our uh, length of stay, our average length of stay for our patients. At if we're, uh, you know, this is variable because um, some patients may have pre-existing diabetes, heart issues, lung issues, but uh, I would say in general, the average patient, if we do a big open debulking five to seven days, and if we're able to do this uh, robotically, it seems like we're getting most of them out by post-operative day number three. I mean, do you think that's yeah, that's that your... very reasonable. Yeah. Okay. I mean, most patients are here for a week, but if we do it minimally invasively, like with the robot or a laparoscope, maybe it's about three to four days. Right. I think, you know, the only other thing I would also say is that despite the hospital stay being about a week or less, you know, the overall recovery for our patients, it does take some time to get your energy back. Um, so we don't expect our patients to be uh, skipping and jumping and doing all kinds of things after week one, but we do expect them to be eating, walking, going to the bathroom, um, and getting back to a normal life as quick as possible. But it may take about four to six weeks before you get to that 80% energy level, and maybe another month or so before you hit 100%. Right. But I think uh, we need to emphasize, as you said, this is generally uh, very well tolerated. And, you know, for a uh, one year added overall survival rate, uh, a few additional days, I think, are, are well worth it. And it's uh, uh, I'm fortunate to be able to have that discussion and offer this treatment modality uh, to our patients. And uh, uh, Dr. Den, my partner and I, uh, once again, continue to thank you and Dr. Gabriel for uh being a part of this team and you know and doing everything we can to affect the survival of our patients and give them a, a better overall quality of life as well so yeah we're happy to help i hope this has been beneficial for those of you who are um, viewing this uh, video um, uh, if you have any further questions we're happy to talk about it at any time and uh, I hope you have a good afternoon or evening, depending upon uh, where you're looking at it. Dr. Bagheri, give it home to your family. Hope you have a good night. You too, Matt. You take care. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye, everyone.